I'm more of a collator of information. I reach out to professionals in the industry. I've studied exercise science. I got my CSCS. Uh, I read the work of the professionals and usually domain specific professionals. If it's a nutrition question, I want to talk to PhDs in nutrition or RDNs. If it's a strength question, I want to listen to Brad Schoenfeld's work from, you know, his hypertrophy research, people with PhDs in exercise phys. My co-author of the Vertical Diet is a PhD RDN who was director of dietetics at UNLV and an instructor in the exercise phys department. He's uniquely qualified in both areas that we're in interested in nutrition and training to make sure that we put well over 200 peer-reviewed researched articles to support all of our recommendations. Plus, I've been around a long time. I don't get moved very often by a lot of these uh, claims that are made in popular social media environments. Stan, you recently went viral for uh, I don't know if it's a quote that you shared or something you shared on another podcast about sleep being more necessary, I guess. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how you phrase it, but sleep being more important than cardio for fat loss. And I've also heard you say that you don't prescribe steady state cardio to your clients. So I'd love for you to maybe start by explaining how those two can be true if the driver of weight loss is actually a calorie deficit. That's good. Yeah. You know, <laughs> What I said and what I've been saying for many years is that if you're waking up at 4 a.m. to do cardio uh, after only five hours of sleep, you're stepping over $100 bills to pick up nickels. I think it's important to recognize that sleep is the foundation upon which everything else sits. If you don't get sufficient sleep, you end up burning more muscle and the body becomes stingy with the fat. You end up increasing ghrelin hormones so you're hungrier during the day. You are not recovering from your training sessions sufficiently. You're awake more hours during the day, which just gives you more opportunity to get eaten, get hungry and eat another meal. All of those things for me make it such that I prioritize sleep with my clients. And I find that that is something that is deficient in the vast majority of people that I work with. We're all burning the candle at both ends, trying to get ahead. And we're not even giving ourselves an opportunity to be successful. We're getting to bed at midnight and having to wake up at five. You know, or if we get to bed at 11, then we're scrolling through social media. You know, it's not actually sleep. If I can encourage folks just to, first of all, set aside a, a time frame under which they could potentially be successful, seven plus hours is the recommended dose, and then try and work towards what I call good sleep hygiene, avoiding the blue lights, your telephone, the TV, at least an hour before bed, sleeping in a cold, quiet, dark room. You know, waking up early and getting exposed to sunlight so you can set your circadian rhythms for the day and so that you're actually tired at night to go to sleep. So I'm straying off from the original question, trying to point out all the ways in which you can optimize sleep. But yes, I would much prefer people slept than do cardio. Now, the specific answer to cardio, I think mean, cardio is great for health, for heart health. You can get cardio many ways. It doesn't have to be steady state cardio. Cardio is not that good for weight loss. I know that's hard to hear, but the fact of the matter is, is that we don't burn as many calories as we think during doing cardio. Your body becomes efficient at it over time. We also tend to overestimate the number of calories that we burn doing cardio. It's not terribly enjoyable. It's not something people do consistently for the long term, adhere to. So I don't try and set people up for failure by giving them 30, 40 minutes of treadmill. If there's a, a significant barrier to entry, you got to get in your car, you got to drive to the gym, you got to do your 40 minutes of treadmill, and you got to come home. We're going to abandon that very quickly in a program that isn't consistent with our lifestyle and convenient to adhere to. Also, there's the problem with compensation. It seems like the more exercise that we do, what we say call exercise activity, we get hungry and we get tired and we sit more and eat more. What we end up doing is downregulating the activity that we do for the rest of the day. It becomes kind of a left pocket, right pocket sort of deal. So I encourage cardio. I usually promote a 10-minute walk after each meal because it has so many more benefits other than, you know, it's something that you can fit into your day. It uh, provides you all the cardiovascular benefit, helps with digestion, and blood sugar control, and all those things. And it's, it's something that can be more adhered to better. And then your workouts, you know, we should all be lifting weights. Those are a significant uh, cardiovascular benefit. You're going to get your heart rate elevated for an extended period of time. I mean, if you're lifting hard enough to get a result, you're breathing hard, you know? So and that kind of summarizes, uh, you know, some folks think I'm averse to cardio. I do 30 to 40 minutes of cardio a day, but I do it in 10-minute walks. 
So I've been able to do it consistently for 10 years, even though I travel all over the world uh, very often. I'm always able to get my 30, 40 minutes of cardio in wherever I am, whether it's at a hotel or an airport or you name it. And I do it with those little exercise snacks. I think somebody coined that term. I just do little 10 minute walks. And then I don't actually have to do cardio, which I, I don't enjoy anyhow. You'd never catch me on a treadmill for 40 minutes. Just unbelievably boring. I just don't think it's terribly effective, to be honest. I'd rather invest that time into something that I got a bigger return on. Yeah, the next one's going to be diet and, and specifically calories. If you want to lose weight, you have to be in a calorie deficit, period. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. You had mentioned fasted cardio and burning calories before you eat. And some people talk about intermittent fasting. Some people talk about the carbohydrate insulin model of weight loss. None of that is any more important than maintaining a calorie deficit, which can be done any number of ways. I have my personal preference because I try and fuel people for training so that they have an efficient training stimulus for anaerobic weightlifting. But that having been said, there's numerous paths to the same destination and the, and the best diet's the one you'll follow. And that can be very individualistic as to which one seems the least restrictive to you, which one's the most satiating, which one can you adhere to without succumbing to hunger and overeating? Because that's the bottom line. And so I think Dr. Peter Tia summed it up best by saying there's really only three different ways to create a calorie deficit. It's uh, CR, TR, and DR. It's calorie restriction, which is what you know, many of us are familiar with. You get your app out and you track everything you eat. You weigh and measure your food and put it in little Tupperwares. You look at the labels on, on foods that you eat and you try and maintain a calorie deficit that way. There's uh, TR, time restriction. We're all familiar with the 16-8. And if uh, you can't lose weight on a 16-8, then you got to go 18-6 or 24 or 22-2 if you're eating so much in a two-hour window that you can't maintain a calorie deficit. But that's just time restriction. That's all it is. It's no better than continuous calorie restriction or, or you know counting calories. Uh, but it may be more preferable to some people. They may be less hungry. I can come up with a list of reasons why you shouldn't do it, you know, and we can talk about those. But the next one is dietary restriction. I said CR, TR, and DR, caloric restriction, time restriction, and then dietary restriction. And that's these camps that eliminate certain food groups. That's your vegans, your carnivores, your keto folks. They just eliminate certain foods. If you eliminate carbs, you're probably going to end up in a calorie deficit. If you eliminate all meats or you know, paleo, you just eliminate everything that cavemen didn't eat. You're generally eating more whole food, which tends to be more satiating. But that's all that is. And it's no better than continuous calorie restriction. And, and you really shouldn't be demonizing uh, most foods, certainly most whole foods. And so those are the three paths. And I have clients that, that opt for carnivore. I have clients that are keto. I have clients that are vegan. The vast majority of them utilize a calorie restriction model with a omnivorous, very diverse, mostly whole food diet. Generally, I put them in at about 30% protein, 30, 35% protein uh, as a percentage of total calories, which is not the greatest way to calculate it because uh, based on people's weight, you just want to make sure they get sufficient protein, around 0.8 grams per pound of body weight or one gram per pound of lean weight. And then I, I put in about 30 or less percent of fat and I, the rest are carbs. And the, I say the rest in quotation marks because that's based on your workload. If you're a very active individual and playing sports, then you might need a lot more carbs than someone who's more sedentary. So I base that off of the original calories that we allot for your goals, whether it's a surplus or a deficit for weight gain or weight loss. So it's kind of a real quick way to look at diets in general that doesn't uh, offend, hopefully, too many people. And it's more inclusive. I, can, I welcome everybody under the, the tent who's with their, you know, their specific preferences. I just want to make sure not to demonize anything or to make the claim that any path is better than the other uh, on the whole. What I've seen, Stan, here, that's that's something that makes you truly, I don't know if you're the only one, but it's definitely unique in our space, right, is this non-attachment to a specific way to do something. You're more focused on the outcome and how can we assist and maybe guide and give the support accountability structure that somebody needs, but you're not tied to, like you said, you got clients that are in the carnivore space. You got kind of clients that are vegan, vegetarian. You know, A lot of them are probably following your vertical diet approach, which we're definitely going to get to here later on, but- how have you been able to, in an industry that is so muddled with this dogma, like separate yourself, but really, I mean, it, I think it makes you stand out. 
Definitely want to, I definitely want to circle back to that. Cause I mean, that's, that's really the world that I live in kind of operate in, you know, is this kind of behavioral change, you know, how do we kind of inject these positive habits that are going to produce positive outcomes, real transformation in our lives. So I definitely want to circle back there, but I want to touch on something that you were talking about when you went through the CR, TR and DR is you made a slight comment around maybe the time restricted, the fasting, maybe not being the best approach for people, which I'd love for you to maybe kind of, you know, unpack that here a little bit, because I think if you go online these days, it's like you will see people screaming from the mountaintop that fasting is the most effective way to lose weight. It's some, a, you know, I've, I mean, there's obviously, I believe there's a lot of benefits. It's really helped me, but why specifically for, I guess, fat loss would fasting not be a good effective approach? I think fasting would be a great approach for weight loss. I don't think it's any better than, than calorie restriction or dietary restriction. Uh, and the research bears that out. It, it's, it's whatever diet you can adhere to. We, they've studied, had thousands of studies now on, on different diets and long-term adherence, dietary adherence is pretty similar. It's pretty poor overall, to be honest, as we know, over 50% of people gain the weight back within a year and somewhere north of 70 to 90% of people gain the weight back within three years. Uh, most of these long-term studies show on average about a 2% weight loss over three to five years. That's why when medications like uh, semaglutide come onto the scene and they show a 17 to 23% average weight loss after three years, uh, it, it starts to raise your eyebrows. It, it, but what it pinpoints is, is that hunger, because that's what semaglutide does, it suppresses appetite. Hunger is the reason people fail on diets. And that's why I spend so much time talking about satiety and compliance uh, and which diet is, is the uh, least restrictive that makes you the less, least hungry because that's where you're going to end up failing. Willpower is not a good strategy. Uh, you'll lose that battle every time. The body is incredible at getting what it wants. And so you have to get in front of it. We have a kind of a toolbox of, of things that you know we can utilize to get in front of hunger because once it hits you consciously, you're in trouble. You have to kind of subconsciously get in front of it so that you experience very little and less often hunger. And the, you know, the toolbox obviously includes eating more protein, eating more fiber, drinking more water before or during meals, you know, getting more sleep. Even the 10-minute walks, even getting 6,000 steps a day helps with some satiety benefit. Eating mostly whole foods and less ultra-processed, highly palatable foods. Uh, those kinds of things all lend themselves well to satiety. Okay, so back to intermittent fasting. Now, I mentioned that, that I design diets for what I believe are people that should be uh, exercising, particularly weightlifting. You know, I've worked with lots and lots of athletes over the years. People are familiar with a lot of the famous athletes that I've worked with. I design diets for uh, performance. And, I, and that's including dad bods and soccer moms. I think that performance is pretty important. I think form follows function and that everybody should be lifting weights. And the optimal weightlifting stimulus is, you know, anaerobic. It's to within a rep or two of failure. It's, you know, something that you should do at least at least three days a week. I'm designing a diet that includes sufficient food. We know the International Society of Sports and Nutrition recommends getting at least three. They, they talk about four evenly spaced protein feedings a day. There's no mechanism in the body to store protein. And so once it's gone, it's gone. And your body, if it has repairs to make, it has to wait till you feed it again. I'm not saying you're going to lose 10 pounds of muscle because you missed a meal, uh, but we're talking about optimizing performance as it uh, relates to sports performance in the International Society of Sports Nutrition. They're recommending about four evenly spaced meals a day with a minimum of about 30 plus grams of protein to trigger muscle protein synthesis. So they don't even encourage snacking, let alone missing a meal. 78% uh, of successful dieters in the weight control registry, which has tracked over 10,000 dieters for uh, more than six years who have lost uh, 60 pounds and kept it off, they eat breakfast, 70%, 78% of successful dieters. So it's not as though eating breakfast is, is a, a hack. If you're not hungry as a result of skipping breakfast, then, then that's fine. That's you know a way for you to comply with your diet and not be hungry. That's great. But now we're seeing some other research beyond the sports research uh, and getting sufficient protein periodically throughout the day to, to maintain or fuel muscle. We're seeing in terms of what's called chrononutrition. And that's where eating breakfast uh, can help with sleep at night. Now the intermittent fasting community is suggesting maybe you do eat breakfast and you skip dinner. We see that in study groups, those that eat the larger breakfast tend to eat less for lunch and dinner. They tend to have what's called reduced postprandial glycemia. They have less blood sugar elevation and duration after breakfast because they're most insulin sensitive in the morning. 
And it also seems to carry over to subsequent meals where your lunch there uh, has less postprandial glycemia when you eat a sufficient breakfast, particularly a high protein breakfast. If people do want to intermittent fast, I'd suggest they skip dinner, not breakfast, because there's a whole host of benefits to waking up in the morning and eating breakfast. It's when you're hungry, your insulin sensitivity is the best, your muscles are most in need after that long fast. Cortisol is elevated and that helps, uh, you can help blunt that by eating breakfast. Uh, that would be my suggestion. My daughter doesn't eat breakfast and it frustrates me to no end, but I don't force her to do it. And my son, of course, you know, he loves to eat breakfast. And so I just make sure that she gets sufficient calories and protein throughout the rest of the day. I'm not suggesting by any stretch of the imagination that it isn't just as equivalent or just as beneficial for potentially beneficial for weight loss if you can maintain a calorie deficit with it. But I think all of those other reasons that I mentioned makes it less beneficial for performance, sleep, blood sugar control, a whole host of things that we have measured. And some people will weigh in and say, well, when you fast for an extended period of time, you experience autophagy. There's no evidence that a 12-hour uh, window uh, and a 16-hour window are any different with respect to long-term health. We just don't have any outcome trials on humans that suggest that fasting provides an additional lifespan or health span benefit, uh, as opposed to just not eating for 12 hours between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. And autophagy is obtained simply from exercise itself. And so it's not as though you need to skip meals to, uh, to get those benefits. So that, that's really kind of, there may be a few other things I'm forgetting, but off the top of my head, that's, uh, you know, I'm not trying to shit on anybody's diet. I, I make some recommendations to the keto people as well. I think that a high saturated fat keto diet can lead to elevated LDL, which is a known causal risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So you, you'd want to do a, a high monounsaturated fat, lower saturated fat keto diet if that's what you intended to do. We know that people uh, on a keto diet tend to lose uh, glycogen, which is three parts water, which is 70% sodium. And so oftentimes they end up getting low in electrolytes. It's probably the, the biggest contributor to what's called the keto flu when people get tired from going keto. It might not necessarily be the carbohydrates. It's probably the hydration portion. It's probably the, the sodium uh, reduction. Uh, that's occurring. And so I make those recommendations with respect to keto as well. I just, I think there's always pros and cons to, you know, and, and with the continuous calorie restriction, some people just don't like weighing and measuring and tracking their food. It can, they can uh, create an unhealthy relationship with food that way. So there's certainly disorders to be addressed uh, with any type of dieting. Yeah. And I don't, I don't really feel like you're, you know, you're shitting or attacking anything here at this point. I mean, you're providing everything from a, you know, research, you know, data backed position and previously earlier on said, Hey, not all of this is going to work for everybody. This is what the studies show, but we got to understand there's going to be some individual cases. So, you know, the audience can take this, you know, and then it's like, okay, just don't take stand for his word. Like understand that this is, this is research science backed. Let me go apply it. And then let me become familiar with my own feedback, how things operate. And I think that's what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to give people the education, the tools that they can make these decisions on their own. We're not trying to prescribe anything to anybody. Yeah. I'm not a guru. I, I don't sit over here and try and make shit up or just tell people what, what I think worked for me, because oftentimes people do things in spite of themselves that really have no evidence to, in terms of outcomes. I'm more of a collator of information. I, I reach out to professionals in the industry. I've studied exercise science. I got my CSCS. Uh, I read the work of the professionals and usually domain specific professionals. If it's a nutrition question, I want to talk to PhDs in nutrition or RDMs. You know, if it's a strength question, I want to I want to listen to Brad Schoenfeld's work from, you know, his hypertrophy research. People with PhDs in exercise phys. My co-author of the Vertical Diet is a PhD RDN who was director of dietetics at UNLV and an instructor in the exercise phys department. He's uniquely qualified uh, in both areas that we're interested in, nutrition and training, to make sure that we you know, put well over 200 peer-reviewed uh, researched articles to support all of our recommendations. Plus, I've been around a long time and I, I'm, I, don't get, uh, I don't get moved very often by a lot of these uh, claims that are made in popular social media and environments. I, I just think a lot of people spend a lot of time majoring in the minors or over-exaggerating the meaningfulness of some mechanism that they can describe biochemically. I followed Dr. Peter Atia for years, patiently, because I've been at this for 30 years, watching him piss on keto sticks on Instagram for three straight years and show us his, his uh, state of ketosis uh, and intermittent fast. And he was famous for doing 
three-day, five-day, seven-day fasts uh, quarterly or, or more often. And now, uh, through much trial and error, and uh, after Peter interviewed some of the, the most academically qualified individuals in, in those areas, he no longer does intermittent fasting. He no longer does keto. His DEXA scans showed that he lost muscle mass. His energy levels weren't sufficient for hypertrophy training, which is his current focus. It's interesting to see me over here. I'm just some meathead that fell in love with lifting weights. And so it's really rewarding to see someone of Peter Atia's caliber. And there's others who I followed over the years. Peter's obviously one of the more notable people more recently is a Stanford MD and a Johns Hopkins oncology uh, surgeon who's in the longevity field now. And it's interesting to see that, that he has fallen upon the fountain of youth, uh, which we all have long since discovered, which is strength. And he's found that when you lift weights, it, it dramatically improves your lifespan and health span. And so he's focused almost exclusively on strength. And remember, I said strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never a strength. When you begin focusing on strength, I found this when talking to Mike Mutzel, who was a keto intermittent fasting uh, fan for many, many years. I found this when I was on the podcast with um, carnivore MD, Paul Saladino, who was a keto intermittent fasting fan for many years. Uh, as soon as they became focused on strength, they started understanding the value of eating enough, often enough, uh, with sufficient carbohydrates specifically to fuel that workload, that performance, that bout of lifting in the gym. You cannot, as you know, just go in there and cross T's and dot I's. It's not just I did this many sets and reps. You have to train hard enough. You have to take your body somewhere it's never been before. The stimulus has to be sufficient to trigger a, a response, and it has to be progressive over time. And if you ever go in and don't outperform, uh, maybe not last week, but certainly last month, if there isn't some sort of progression, you're not continually taking your body somewhere it hasn't been before, you'll stop progressing from that stimulus. And so you have to be sufficiently fueled. We also used to believe, and I think the keto people uh, had, had argued for a long time, you know, your liver produces carbohydrates and puts them into the bloodstream and you can drive a car, you know, 100 miles uh, an hour on a half tank of gas as easily as you can on a full tank of gas. Those are always the arguments that have been made over the years. But as it turns out that we don't store carbohydrates in just one place in the muscle, they're stored in different places in the muscle. When you top off your carbohydrate stores, the, the last place that's filled is also the first place that's drained during training. And that's in the sarcoplasmic reticulum where the carbohydrates are first released. They trigger you know, calcium, which fires the troponin, tropomyosin, uh, you know, muscle contraction, filament you know, contraction. For those people who study uh, exercise phys, that stimulus is most optimal with more carbohydrates or a, a full you know, load of carbohydrates. And once those start to decline during training, then you're not going to have as good of a training performance. So it does matter that you have sufficient carbohydrates to fuel the workout. Great segue here, you know, because I, I, I love to talk specifics here on, on training, specifically building muscle and strength training. You know, we talked about earlier on cardio not being near as effective for fat loss or muscle building as, as training. And I think a lot of people will be like, well, if I'm trying to lose weight, why would I go in and, and lift heavy? Like, shouldn't I just be constantly having my heart rate elevated? So let's talk to the guys out there, how to set up, you know, once again, they're not going to be a true beginner. So not somebody that's just like their first day stepping into the gym, but they've been bouncing around. They've been, you know, maybe been doing some CrossFit. Maybe they've been, you know, doing the, the express lane at the, at the gym. What does a good strength program look like in terms of days, volume, frequency, exercises? Is it free weights, machines? Is it cables? Is it a variation of, of all that? I know there's a lot there, but yeah, if we can kind of walk through just like we did with the, the nutrition, some of these core fundamental principles that we need. Well, the ultimate question was, what does a good strength training program look like? But you, the intro, you said that people oftentimes train differently to lose weight. They focus on the energy expenditure side. And we spoke earlier about the fact that it's the energy intake side that is most relevant to weight loss. Uh, very simply, you lose weight in the kitchen. You don't exercise away weight necessarily. I mentioned it's not terribly effective. It's not a terribly efficient 
uh, your body compensates for it. It downregulates the number of calories that you burn, all of those reasons that we don't use the gym to exercise. Getting our heart rate up for an extended period of time is great for health, but it's not the best thing for weight loss. So lose weight in the kitchen, create a calorie deficit, maintain the deficit. Now, unfortunately, in terms of maintaining a calorie deficit for weight loss isn't the best stimulus for muscle gain. When you're in a calorie deficit, it's harder to gain muscle. That would be a, another reason why you should eat more protein more often is if you're in a calorie deficit. But even then, even if you're eating more protein more often, if you're in a calorie deficit, it's very hard to build muscle, particularly for the, the person that you described. The person watching us, the people watching us today are intermediate lifters at the very least. They're, they're no strangers to the gym. They're in there working out. And sometimes they get frustrated because they've been at it for a year or two years or 10 years. And they kind of look the same as they did last year or five years ago. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, because ultimately lifespan and health span is dependent upon that we continue to do these things. You know, when they measure people's strength, it's less about their current level of strength and more about what they had to do to get there and have, it, ha have had to continue to do to get there. So it's an ongoing process, you know, whether it's 30 minutes, 150 minutes of cardio a week, or it's weightlifting three times a week. Those things never end. There's no finish line to this deal. You know, <laughs> that's one of the challenging things with people who go on programs is that they're, they never end. That's why it should become a lifestyle. It should be simple, sensible, and sustainable. And it should be something that you can adhere to long-term. Compliance is the science. Okay. So if I'm encouraging someone to gain muscle in the gym, I'm asking them first and foremost to try and get into a small calorie surplus. Uh, and that would be dependent upon whether or not they had a significant amount of body fat that they intended to lose first. Maybe I would put them in a neutral calorie rather than a surplus or a deficit, just, just at a calorie maintenance and try and do a body recomposition, which can sometimes happen if you have a significant amount of body fat and you're somewhat undertrained. You can gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. The less fat you have to lose and the more experienced you are, the less likely it is you're going to gain muscle at a, in the calorie maintenance. So put you in a slight calorie surplus. And 300 or 500 calorie surplus is just as good as a 1500 calorie surplus, probably better because you won't gain as much fat. And so don't think that just because you eat more calories, you're going to gain more muscle because the limiting factor there is physiologically, you just can't build muscle that fast. I don't care how, how hard you train and how much you eat. That process is, uh, is laborious and it takes time. So be patient, be consistent, be persistent, get into a small calorie surplus, get sufficient protein, about a gram a day, get four Evenly spaced meals a day would be my recommendation. So now the stimulus, if you want to build muscle, and I don't encourage people to go to the gym and just exercise because you, this has to be measurable and progressible. There's a difference between training and exercise. Training being measurable and progressible, exercise being battle ropes and burpees and, and burning calories or supposedly because you sweat and breathed hard. That's not anything anybody enjoys. Any trainer can tire any trainee out and make them go home exhausted and sweaty and, and breathing hard. It doesn't mean they got a result. It doesn't mean it was an effective training session. So I don't recommend battle ropes and burpees. I, I recommend weightlifting. In my book, I actually stole it from uh, Dr. Brett Contreras, a PhD glute guy. Of course, I credit him for it. It's called the Evidence-Based Guidelines of Hypertrophy, one of the most thorough charts and easy to read, but it goes down the list. And first and foremost is frequency. Most people should train each body part twice a week. You know, whether you do a full body Monday and a full body Friday, or you do a upper Monday, lower Tuesday, upper Thursday, lower Friday, doesn't matter. Okay, training every body part twice a week, mainly because you want to train your body part uh, and give it about two to three days to rest and then train it again. If you give it a full week or 10 days, you may uh, stimulate a little bit of, of growth, but then that might also, in detraining, it might also decline over the course of the, the time that you've been away from training. So the idea is just to keep tacking on these little bouts of stimulus so you can continue to grow. So about twice a week per body part. The split I really set up based on somebody's personal schedule. If you're a busy individual, you're, you're going to be able to go to the gym less, then I'm, I'm going to have you do a full body workout, you know, Monday and Friday. I get people who work a ton of hours during the week. I might have them go in Wednesday night and do a, a really quick full body workout or Wednesday morning early. And then have them do their longer, harder sessions on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, when they're well-rested, well-fed. And some people who want to train even more, I might have them split chest in the morning on Saturday, back at night on Saturday night, quads in the morning on Sunday, and hamstrings at night on Sunday night. And then Wednesday is a full-body workout, just to, to keep 
the progress going. So that'd be how I would design something for a busy professional. But if, if you've got all the time in the world and you want to have the best program, I think you should train at least four, possibly five days a week. Break that up into whether it's a push-pull legs or it's an upper-lower. But now we have to talk about what's the most sufficient training to stimulate growth. You can build just as much muscle lifting heavy weights for five reps as you can, lifting a medium weight for 12 reps as you can, lifting a light weight for 20 to 30 reps, so long as they're to within a rep of failure. And that's what we call intensity. The heavier weights, obviously, are going to get stronger because strength is specific. It has a nervous system component, but strength doesn't drive hypertrophy. So you could lift a lighter weight for 12, 15 reps. And the heavier weight, you may incur more fatigue and potentially increase your susceptibility or exposure to injury. And so those are all considerations to have if you want strength as opposed to size. When I train MMA athletes, UFC athletes, I have them do heavier loads. I don't want to build muscle. I don't want to add weight to a, an athlete that's trying to cut weight. You know, I want to keep them in their weight class, but I want them to be strong. And strength doesn't require uh, hypertrophy. It can help. A larger muscle can become a stronger muscle. And I've gone from obviously th up through the weight classes all the way to 275 and 308 over the years. And Eddie Cohn started at 165 and ended up at 242. So yes, building muscle, you know, you, you can obviously gain weight and gain strength over the years. So you have to be within a rep or two of failure. That's what's really important. Now, we used to believe, and this research is still evolving, Brad Schoenfeld's work from 10 years ago is different than it is from last week and last year. We used to believe there were three components to building muscle. It was uh, uh, mechanical tension, and that's just putting a, a weight uh, and moving it through range of motion. Metabolic stress. And that's, uh, you know, if you do a bunch of reps and you get the pump, we you know, believed that those metabolite, all the testosterone and growth hormone and all those other things that would accumulate as a result of, of doing, you know, Arnold talked about the pump, right? We believe that metabolic stress was a muscle builder, particularly because 20% of, of muscle is water or 70% of muscle is water, but 20% of the muscle is sarcoplasm, which is just fluid. So we believe that metabolic stress and then muscle damage. We thought that, you know, when you damage the muscle, it's, it's recovery uh, causes it to get stronger. We now believe that almost 100% of the stimulus comes from the mechanical tension, it comes from lifting the weight. The metabolic stress component has recently been challenged. It seems that metabolic stress and muscle damage are passengers, that if you train hard enough to get a sufficient stimulus to grow, and, and you're within a rep or two of failure, you're probably going to get a pump and you're probably going to do some damage. But those aren't the drivers of the growth. Those are passengers. And so we'll stay focused on mechanical tension. Now we know from the research that that's just lifting weights, mechanical tension. Now we know from the research that the lengthened position contributes to more hypertrophy than the shortened position. So you want to train through a full range of motion and control the weight on the way down. And that's the timing or the pace of the repetition. And that is somewhere between, you know, it's just under control, two to five seconds. Doing a 10 second eccentric isn't gonna give any more growth than a two second eccentric. And so there's no reason to, to purposely do a long negative. Uh, it might create more muscle damage, but again, that's not the driver of growth. Control the weight on the negative, go through a full range of motions where there's still tension at end range. That's pretty important. Say on a bicep curl, if you're standing there when the, and the dumbbell's at your side, there's relatively little tension in the bicep. But if you put it onto a preacher curl bench at the bottom, there is tension, right? Or if you're just in a, on an incline bench leaning back at, and you're keeping your arms, there's tension. Uh, if you take a, a uh, cable and pull it through your legs so that the stack's behind you and you do your curl that way, when you're at full extension, there's still tension because the cable's pulling, you know, back through your legs. If if that's description is is uh, sufficient for people to follow, that's just an example. The same with quadriceps. When you're standing there at the bar on your back when you're squatting, there's no tension. It's not until you bend your knees that you start to create tension. Now you want to go all the way down to get as much knee angle, as much stretch or lengthened position in the quadricep as you can. That's why a full squat would be better than a 90 degree squat for hypertrophy. Now, there's something to be said for 45 degree or 90 degree squats for strength because strength specific. And if your athlete is only moving from that knee angle or that 
overall angle, hip angle, and knee angle, you may be able to strengthen that position more by working in that position. And so I, I want to be careful to distinguish between strength and hypertrophy. Leg press, if you're focused on your hip angle with feet high and outside on the leg press platform, uh, you're not going to have a whole lot of knee angle. You're going to have a kind of a vertical shin. And so you're not going to get as much stretch in the quad. All the stretch will be up in the hip, be more glute. And so where you place your feet in and down and how much knee angle you get will determine how much stretch or length and position you get in the quad. And that's a better hypertrophy stimulus than a heavier weight loaded through the hips with the, the glutes participating in the movement. So even load doesn't matter. What matters is, especially if you're recruiting multiple muscle groups uh, in the multi-joint movement, that's why isolation movements are just as effective for hypertrophy as multi-joint movements on a specific muscle. We use multiple joint movements because they get benefits for multiple muscles. If you don't do that exercise through a significant range of motion and you your body responds differently than someone else's, for example, if uh, you're bench pressing, you get three bench pressers. One guy might have huge front delts from bench pressing. Another guy might get huge triceps from bench pressing. Another guy might get a huge chest from, from bench pressing. And some lucky motherfucker probably gets all three. <laughs> You know, but I'm not that guy. I got big front delts from bench pressing. I didn't necessarily get big triceps or or uh, or chest from bench pressing. So when I worked with Flex Wheeler, he took me off of bench pressing because I already had huge front delts, and that's what the bench press did for me. And so he would put me onto dumbbells and make me bring my sternum up and drop my shoulders back and get my elbow really deep and wrap my pec around my rib cage to get a full stretch. And I got more volume in my chest than I'd ever gotten from over 20 years of competing in six months of training with flex. And uh, just because he, he made me utilize an exercise that more specifically benefited my chest. And uh, so I, he did the same thing. He wouldn't let me squat. He took me to the leg press, feet in and down, huge knee angle. I went from 12 plates on a side to six plates on a side. It's humiliating. You know, but eventually that six plates on a side week after week after week with the in and with the feet in and down and the, and the knee bend and the greater range of motion and more stretch, that started going up to seven plates, eight plates, nine plates, 10 plates over time. And my legs grew and I had the, the most quad volume that I'd had in over 20 years of competing from training with flex and isolating uh, and using less weight, the quad muscles. So range of motion is on there. We talked about tempo, two to five second rep. We talked about frequency twice a week. We talked about volume. So volume, now you've got folks out there now uh, kind of with the Dorian mindset that you only need a couple sets per workout. Mike Isriatel promotes about five to 10 sets per workout, per body part. I've settled in on about the six range. I would rather do, I don't like doing four sets of 10. I would rather do two sets to damn near failure and then go pick a different exercise and work the muscle from a variety of different angles. Because I, I believe people save themselves. If you know you're going to have to do four sets of hack squat, what's the likelihood you're going to invest everything into the first set? And uh, I'll use incline dumbbell press as an example. Lots of people go to the gym, get on the incline, they'll grab the 60s and do 10 reps. Then they'll grab the 70s and do 10 reps. Then they'll grab the 80s and they'll do 10 reps. Then they'll grab the 100s and they'll knock out their top set. And they might be able to get seven and their spotter helps them with a couple of reps. You didn't do four sets. You did one set. If the 60s, you could have done 20 reps. You know, that's not a sufficient stimulus. So don't think about it in just in terms of crossing T's and dotted I's and, you know, in volume. But is that specific set, is that pretty close to failure? It doesn't have to be failure. I, I gave the example of your spotter helps you with a rep. It doesn't have to be failure. You can get just as big a stimulus by leaving one or two reps in the tank. You have to have worked hard. And don't use junk volume and don't pre-exhaust your top set with 10, 10, 10, working up the rack. Uh, I would rather do two, two, two as far as warmups go and then have, and then do two sets of, of the hundreds. And those are, I think are more effective sets and then pick a different exercise or two different exercises. But I do about six sets. I'll do maybe two sets of three different exercises that way. I'll, I might squat first and then do a hack squat and then do a leg extension. Even with squats, I only do them because I love them. Uh, not because I think they benefit the muscles that I need the most work on. And so you have to be cautious, you know, what you select. And so, yeah, frequency, volume, load, we talked about tempo, range of motion, the exercises that you pick, you know, generally the, the multi-joint movements you do first in the workout and do the smaller joints later. 
rest periods, rest periods. How important is this? And this, this goes to what you said. A lot of people go to the gym and try and burn calories. And so they're running through their workout with short rest periods, these little 30 second rest periods. It's like a CrossFit workout, not the best stimulus for growth. Schoenfeld did another study. He showed one minute rest periods compared to three minute rest periods. The three minute rest period people had greater hypertrophy growth. And that's simply because when you do a set, you deplete certain metabolites in your system. A few things happen. One, your central nervous system is stressed and it takes a couple, three minutes to recover. If it's a squat set, it might take five minutes. If it's a bicep curl, it might only take a minute. And so it's different for different body parts. Acid accumulation, we used to think was lactic acid, but it's really hydrogen ion buildup and your inability to, to process those out. And so you get acid buildup. Well, that takes time for your body to dissipate so that you can do another set with sufficient load. Remember, me mechanical tension being the most important thing. You don't want the limiting factor to be the fact that you've got oxygen debt or you've got lactate clearance issues or, you, you know, you don't want that to be the limiting factor. And then lastly, a creatine phosphate. Most of these sets are done in the creatine phosphate system, not in the, in the glycolytic system. That depletes itself. And so you need a couple of minutes for that creatine. Hopefully you're taking creatine monohydrate and, uh, you know, adenosine triphosphate breaks down to adenosine diphosphate. And then you need a, a phosphate for it to, for the energy. And that's, you know, that first 50, 10 to 15 seconds of energy, which is what most of these anaerobic uh, weightlifting uh, bouts are about. And so give it ample time, rest at least two minutes between most sets. Uh, I think Dorian said one time after a heavy set of legs, it might take him four minutes to remember his name. And I'm in that camp. I rest longer. My, my UFC athletes, it's really hard to get them to adhere to that because they look at everything in terms of how does this, is this specific to the ring? And your training stimulus has nothing to do with your performance in your sport. It's simply to build either muscle or strength or both, depending on what the demands of your sport are. And the optimal stimulus for that is not to move fast through a bunch of different exercises. Uh, it's, to, it's to get sufficient loading to create a stimulus and then to progress that over time. Uh, and you need the rest. And so these workouts may take longer and probably should take longer. One option for busy people is to utilize superset antagonistic body parts or opposite opposing body parts. So you could do a dumbbell press for chest, rest for a minute, and then do a, a lat pull down and then rest. Yeah, for and I would minute. also say, I mean, I would also say if you're going from, you know, the, the, the standard, you know, junk volume workout where you're doing 25, 30 sets for chest, you know, you reduce it down to the prescribed, you know, six to 10 that we've been talking about. It's okay. Yeah. We're removing a bunch of the junk work that we're going to be doing. And it makes a lot more sense now that we can get this rest in. If it's six sets, three minute rest in between, it's only 18 minutes of rest paired with maybe a 40 second set. Now you're in and out of the gym and still under 40 minutes. If everything else is getting optimize and check so it doesn't have to become these two and a half three hour marathon workouts because we're not doing 30 sets anymore agreed nor is it necessary to be that long so uh, you can do the antagonistic body part workouts do a, a bench press rest a minute lat pull down rest a minute bench press rest a minute now the rest between bench presses is over two minutes and so you don't lose a significant amount of strength on the second and third set uh, or the second set in that case, if you're getting 10 reps on the first set and six reps in the second, you probably haven't rested long enough uh, and you're having too big of a decline in performance. One thing in terms of time saving, just because we're talking about busy professionals and, and sometimes just ha having, you know, something's better than nothing and just getting there is important. But if, you know, some people think if they can't get a sufficient workout in that, that you know, why bother going? One is the warm up. It doesn't have to take you 45 minutes. You don't need to foam roll and all that other stuff. You can get on a, a salt bike and do three 10 second sprints and you'll be amply warmed up and then go get under whatever exercise you're going to do and just use a lighter weight and you can quickly progress into doing your, your exercises. Another would be post-workout. There's really no evidence that, uh, uh, well, this could be pre-workout as well. There's just no evidence that stretching to taking your time to static stretch decreases injury or improves recovery. There's no evidence to that. Also, in terms of flexibility, there's equivalent outcomes between lifting through a full range of motion and doing static stretching. And static stretching provides no additional benefits. So just lift through a full range of motion. You'll, you'll get your uh, flexibility benefits from that. And that's been researched as well. And I'm not shitting on stretching. I'm just saying we're talking about busy people. And that is not something that's going to add to 
It's going to increase performance. It's not going to increase flexibility. It's not going to decrease recovery time. So it's something you can you can cut out. And do something do something else with your time. Now you touched on and you talked about the importance of the length in position and that really being you know the the more important range that we need to focus on that's going to drive hypertrophy. I think it was and I may be inaccurate in this, but I'm pretty sure that's. Uh, Dr. Jacob Wilson. This is back maybe going on a decade ago out of the University of Tampa. I think he was working with Ben and a lot of the early in my 40s stuff that Ben was creating. I think they were studying loaded stretching. Have you seen any any of the research on loaded stretching, like in a lengthened range on like a lat pull or or you mentioned the 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 inclined bicep curl, like just kind of sitting there like after a set for a 15, 20 second stretch that's loaded? Have you seen any any research that points to that as a big driver or a more effective driver of hypertrophy? Uh, I don't think it's a big driver or a more effective driver than just the repetitions themselves through a full range of motion. But there is some evidence that you get an increased outcome. Most of this was in bird wing studies where they hanged weights off of birds' wings and they saw a hypertrophy benefit. Uh, but the birds weren't lifting. That's the thing. Now, if you're just doing loaded stretching, you can see a hypertrophy benefit. If you're training and then adding loaded stretching, the significance, the meaningfulness of that benefit is is much reduced. I, I do think that at the end of your workout, and Flex had me do these very routinely back in 2008 and 2009, we were, we were doing it. At the end of a chest workout, not after every set, but at the end of your chest workout, if you spend some time stretching that muscle or loading it in a lengthened position, and then we would go over and pose, you know, again, we thought that, you know, by pumping, and that was that metabolic stress kind of theory, you know, Arnold loved to, to do bicep poses in the mirror after training biceps. And there just isn't any evidence that that, you know, I think it's great for practice for the stage, but we just don't see a meaningful difference. You know, I'd rather invest some of that time and energy into something that, that gave me a better return. You know, could you do one more set or, you know, and again, I'm not suggesting that more sets is always uh, the answer all either. As long as the work that you're doing is sufficient, once you go north of, say, six sets per body part, we do see, and again, this is inter-individual variability. Some people can handle more volume. We do see a, a, what we call a diminishing returns. So you, you, you just, for the extra sets that you invest, you get less of a benefit from them. It's kind of asymptotic on the graph if you were to look at it that way. Uh, it's not linear. You know, I'm not recommending doing more. I do think that that's a really neat, that stretching component is neat. I think that's something that... Um, Dante Trudell has, has been promoting for yeah, 20 years. Yeah, I think Meadows had it a big part of uh, the mountain dog yep. training as, as yep. well. I think it was the fourth, the fourth component, activate, load, pump, stretch, I think was the fourth the fourth piece of that, that structure. I that have had. some reservation that if your DOMS is, your delayed onset muscle soreness is, is preventing you from getting your two workouts in a week, that that may be something, loaded stretching, the eccentric is, can cause more muscle damage. And that tissue damage is not a driver of hypertrophy. Mike Isretel might refer to it as a, a, a low stimulus to fatigue ratio. And while it might work, it might also create so much fatigue that it's going to impact your frequency. Uh, so your next workout is, is, it has to be a day yeah. later. Yeah. <laughs> check it's, it's prioritization. Check, check the more important boxes first. And then if you know, you've reached a point where you've plateaued, Hey, maybe there's another option that we can throw in here, do some loaded stretching at the end of the workout. But for a lot of the, the audience it's probably going to be years of real consistent work following these basic principles that are going to continue to lead to the results. So we can probably hold a lot of that stuff. We talked nutrition. We talked training. I love the last few minutes here we have maybe kind of kind of tied all together like when does you talked about obviously the four protein meals being important for a day so that's a timing aspect breakfast being a really important outside of that is there importance to timing of carbs other meal timing principles that we should 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 be focused on what about pre post intra workout carbohydrates can we speak to a little bit of the timing aspect pairing the two nutrition and training here kind of bringing this all together yeah. Well, way down on that list of importance, we do see things like meal timing is in there. This would primarily be for somebody competing in a sport or somebody on a lower carbohydrate diet might want to preferentially put those carbohydrates before and after training. And somebody who's competing in a sport might want to have a lower fat, higher, simple, simpler carbohydrate, lower fiber, two hours before a training bout. And it would depend on the duration of the training bout, whether or not you actually needed uh, intra-workout carbohydrates. If it's a brief training bout, probably not totally necessary. Hydration then becomes uh, the next thing after getting sufficient carbohydrates to fuel your workout either two hours before or throughout your training. 
And I'm kind of talking about these collectively because uh, there is a mechanism by which your body uh, more efficiently absorbs carbs and sodium and water if they're if the concentration is ideal. Okay, if the amount of carbohydrates, sodium, and uh, that's in the water that can influence how well your body absorbs those things because they work together to shuttle water and glycogen and carbohydrates into the muscles. So if you're going to hydrate for a training session, now I've always recommended that we add sodium. I add sodium to most of my athletes' diets, particularly because they're generally not eating fast food or packaged food. And so, and they have a higher sodium demand because they sweat more. Lane Johnson, the Philadelphia Eagles, I work with him and he sweats out five grams of sodium an hour. It's largely genetic. Dr. Sandra Godick from the Heat Institute, a PhD in thermoregulation and hydration. She has a website called levelin.com, L-E-V-E-L-E-N, levelin.com. And she supplies sweat testing patches. And I've had these uh, for a number of my athletes over the years. So you can buy one, they'll mail it to you. You wear it for an hour or put it on your athlete for an hour. You put it back in the package and send it to them. And they'll tell you how much salt your athlete sweats out in an hour. So you can design a more specific rehydration program. And and this is kind of post-training. I just hit on it really quick. The International Society of Sports Nutrition as well says that for every two pounds of weight that you lose or every two, yeah, every kilo, every two pounds of weight that you lose during training, way in before and after, you should replace that with 1.5 liters of water and uh, a sufficient glucose and sodium solution to replace, particularly if you're training twice a day, to replace a lot of what you sweat out and burn during training. Could be somewhere around 75 grams of carbohydrates would be around 300 calories, which would be a kind of an expected glucose burn for, you know, a 40, 50 minute workout, unless it's, you know, super high volume or high intensity training, Uh, along with and now that depends, 900 to 1500 milligrams of sodium. Uh, and that would be based on the sweat rate of the individual. Are you a salty sweater? You might need more or less. But that's kind of the concoction. Now let's talk about pre-workout and intra-workout. The ideal concentration, uh, Dr. Sandra talks about this, as does, there's a great video by Simon Hill with, I want to say, Sally Sims, S-I-M-S, PhD, hydration specialist sports performance, sports nutrition. The best hour of, of hydration you'll ever listen to, she talks about uh, Gatorade and, and why it might not be ideal and, and how it's evolved over the years from what it used to be to what it is now. She talks about things like coconut water, uh, all those things that people, you know, for potassium and why they might not be optimal. Uh, and then she gives very specific recommendations and, and I'll, I'll give them to you now. She wants to see about a 1% to 2% solution of sodium and about a 3% solution of glucose. Could be dextrose, sucrose, glucose of sugar. And that breaks down like this. Say for every gallon of water, just make you can make this for yourself. Make it, take a gallon of water, put 1,000 milligrams of sodium in there. That's one LMNT or two of the liquid IVs. This LMNT has 1,000 milligrams of sodium. Liquid IV has 500 milligrams of sodium. So whatever your preference, get 1,000 milligrams of sodium. I like the LMNT in liquid IV because it's flavored. And so obviously this, this is going to taste rather than just putting salt in there because that tastes horrendous. And then put about 80 grams of sugar in there. Somewhere between 60 to 80 grams of sugar. I use dextrose. It seems to be the easiest on my stomach. There's some evidence that when you combine a two-to-one ratio of dextrose to fructose, that it increases the rate of absorption and decreases the the negative effects potentially for digestion because it's digested faster and it's digested through two different pathways, glucose into the bloodstream, fructose through the liver. So I don't want to overcomplicate it. Mix a gallon of water with one LMNT and 80 grams of of sugar, dextrose, glucose, I don't care, sucrose, whatever you decide. What are your thoughts on uh, cyclic dextrin? Yep, that could be fine too. Here's the reason why. If you have too much water, if you drink too much water, you're going to piss it out. If you take in too much sugar, you're going to piss it out. If you take in too much salt, you're going to piss it out. Your body adapts to the concentration by drawing water into the small intestine and then 
uh, excreting it from the body up to the point at which you may either throw up or get diarrhea if you get too much sodium. It's not a more is better scenario. And so you have to be concerned about is the concentration optimal for the water, salt, and glucose to get absorbed into the bloodstream from the small intestine without causing any disruption in the balance, the homeostasis of the body. And that appears to be the most optimal concentration of water, sodium, and glucose to absorb into the bloodstream. Now, you don't want to chug it in massive amounts. Dr. Godick says drink when you're thirsty, but if you're prepping for an event or you're rehydrating for an event, she likes it to be cold and she likes it to taste good, but you want to sip that because there's only so much you can absorb per minute or per hour. And so you sip on that periodically. During training, let's say maybe six ounces every 15 minutes. You get a kid in a soccer game or a football game. Ideally, you would want to give them, you know, about every 15 minutes, give them about six ounces of this concentrated glucose water. Uh, and that would be, I mean, if you were going to go to such an extreme to try and really optimize the hydration to make them feel as good as possible so that they didn't lose too much weight and have it adversely affect their performance, that would be the recommendation. Ultra endurance events that last for longer than two hours, that would be the concentration. And you'd want to, you wouldn't want to glug that every hour when you're already dehydrated, your body was not going to be able to absorb it at a quick enough rate. You want to drink it about six ounces every 10 to 15 minutes throughout the entire event. Yeah. Wow. Stan, this has been absolutely incredible. I mean, like we've, we've gone nutrition, cardio training, like true, true masterclass here. Obviously for those that want to go a little bit deeper, I want to point them to your site, your books. I know you really walk through, I mean, this in extensive detail in the vertical diet. So tell the audience, tell the guys where they can connect with you, learn more about the diets, uh, the meal prep. You know, if the guy's like, Hey, I don't even want to have to deal with any of this. Like just send me the meals. Plug all that, and then we'll, we'll we'll bring it home with our last and final question. But this has been an it's all at today. Stan Efforting, StanEfforting.com. I have a link to my meal prep there, the Vertical Diet. I have a link to my ebooks, the Vertical Diet 3.0 ebook. It's evolved over the years. It's it's now over 225 pages. I've partnered with Dr. Damon McCune, so we have hundreds of references, videos, peer reviewed, published research articles that I put links to so people could take deeper dives. I give them specific recommendations. And then Stan Efforting uh, is my YouTube and at Stan Efforting is my Instagram. You can find everything you need on there and DM me if you have a specific question. I'm, I, I work hard to try and respond to as many as I can. Yeah, I'm one of the most responsive guys, man. And it's just, it's been a true blessing and honor to have you here today. Uh, like I told you from from the beginning, I've you know been familiar, followed your work for many, many years. It's had an incredible impact. On me, I've done the meal plan. I've done the meal plans in the back. There was a, a point a couple of years ago where I went probably three, four months where you almost you probably supplied eighty percent of my my food for me at the time. So it's 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 been really great to connect with you and just you know share you with the audience here today, Stan. Uh, so we get all that plugged down in the show notes for you guys. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, it'll be down there in the description box. But connect with Stan, give him a follow. You just got a small sliver of the knowledge and wisdom that this man holds. Thirty. Five plus years in the game, IFBB pro, world record power lifter. We didn't even touch on the business side of things. Incredibly successful entrepreneur as well. I, I wanted to get into some of that. Uh, maybe we'll have you back on down down the road to talk more business stuff because I know that's really a strength for you as well. But uh, Stan, we'd like to end every episode here with the same and final question. Uh, you know, I mentioned the the title of the podcast is called The Superman Life. And it's it's not performance based when I talk about living a superhuman life. I, I it, it can be. I think for me, living a superhuman life is understanding that you're here for a purpose. Like none of our lives are are here by accident. But then it's the development of of yourself, the real intentional pursuit of becoming the absolute best version of yourself. That's how I kind of define living a superhuman life. But as somebody that has you know literally reached the pinnacle of many fields, bodybuilding, powerlifting, business, uh, and now the social media space. Stan Efferding, how would you define living a superhuman life? Wow, that's an incredible question. It seems like about everything I've ever been really passionate about, I'll say this, you can be great at anything, but you can't be great at everything. And so I think the most important thing you can do is define for yourself. I think Chris Bell talked about one time, he actually wrote it on his mirror in his bathroom every morning, what's your primary objective is what's your what are your goals what what is it that you're really trying to accomplish in this life and then everything else at some point becomes a distraction you got to be careful that you don't get detoured from that focus that goal that which will make you uh, and i hate to say happy because again it's not a destination it's a journey and and all the things that go into that but i it, it seems like that's such a big 
thing that it gets kind of set aside as I'm going to work on that later because I have to get through this checklist of items, you know, my to-do list for the day, which gives you a sense of accomplishment because you checked off, you know, you crossed off all these things on your, on your, uh, on your, your to-do sheet. I carry a yellow pad of paper around with me and, uh, and I, and I constantly am writing things that I need to get done on it. And at the end of the day, I can, I can, you know, if I have a lot of things crossed off, I feel like I got a lot done. But I realize that the things that really matter the most, the things that, that can't be summarized in a check or a cross, I may or may not have made significant strides towards that goal. And so sometimes I'll put maybe dollar figures by certain things that actually pay me as opposed to things that, that are a distraction uh, so I can prioritize them. But uh, that's the big thing for me is, is it really be cautious about distractions. Put that goal up there. That's your goal. You're allowed to have that goal, you know. We're out helping everybody else, you know, they call it monkeys on your back. I've run a number of businesses. I had a phone company with over 100 employees. And, and my goal every day was just to make sure at the end of the day, not to have everybody else's monkeys on my back. <laughs> Some people call it turd in your pocket. <laughs> you know, you just want to, you want to hand that back as quickly as possible. So we spend so much time helping all the people around us. And 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 I, I think, pretend like you're CEO of, of you know, Stan Efforting for the day, you know, you just got hired to be CEO of your life. What would you recommend to you? You know, if you were advising a friend about the things that you wanted to do with your life, what would you tell him? And then would you proceed to prioritize those, document them, memorialize them in some place that stares at you every single day, whether it's the mirror or your notepad? And are you moving towards that goal and, and being cautious not to get overwhelmed by all the other by life. I, I think that uh, someone who summed that up pretty darn good was um, what was his book Twelve Rules for Life with uh, Jordan, Jordan Peterson. Uh, he's got that one. Uh, Design the day you want. That one video where he talks about you know, and of course you're going to have all these responsibilities and all this other stuff, but. At the end of the day, did you design the day you want? It's a fascinating listen, and he's extraordinary, you know, in the way that he describes things. But I would point people to that because I think we end up at the end of the day not having done the things that we would like to have done for ourselves and, you know, counting all of the check boxes and, and, and to-do list items as something that we achieve when, in fact, it probably didn't advance us ultimately to our goal. Activity is not always productivity, right? No. Uh, God, yeah. Peterson Great. has been- uh, I'm going to steal that. Been, yeah, right. <laughs> well, I'm glad I gave you something here today because you gave us, I mean, just- I'm I got pages, down right now. That's pages, fine. pages of notes here, man. Yeah, JP has been massively influential on, uh, on my life, on the work that we're doing here. You know, it's so interesting that you use that language, become the CEO of your life. Like, there's going to be so many guys here in this, like, that are in our program, have gone through some of our work. I've shot videos titled specifically that. There's actually a piece within our program that says you must become the CEO of your life. Because I deal with high, high achieving guys every single day, business owners, executives, entrepreneurs, investment bankers, doctors, like guys that are crushing it in their field of work. But it's like the home life, the relationship life, maybe the addiction side of life. It's like, why can't we take these same principles over here that have worked to excel in our business and apply it to breaking through in these other areas of our life? So I love that frame that you shared there on just really looking at your life as a business and you sit above it and you're directing traffic. And uh, that means every day is going to be the greatest, uh, just like building a business. Not every day is great. Uh, but if you're set on a plan and you have... I think the review action steps is what a lot of us miss on is reviewing the things that we've done. We just continually add on more, continually try more things. So really, really great response here, Stan. Uh, it's absolutely incredible to have you on here today, guys. Make sure to connect with Stan, get plugged into the vertical diet, um, grab some coolers. Uh, the man's got just a wealth of, of information out there. So uh, really hope you guys enjoyed today's conversation. If you did, you can continue to support us in one of two ways. First off, Hit pause right now, hit that subscribe and rate review the show. But more importantly, if somebody in your life needs to hear this conversation, maybe they're struggling with breaking through some fat loss. Maybe they're struggling with finding the ideal training program that they need, or they're not really leveling up their performance. Do us a favor, but then the blessing of sharing today's conversation. But for Stan Efferding, the Rhino, your coach, Coach Frank Rich here. We love you guys. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>